Christ Hospital. I'm uh, excited to be here and uh, I'm waiting uh, lots of interesting questions and hopefully some interesting answers too. Well, Klaus, thank you so much for inviting me here in your, your space here and, and uh, it's such an honor to sit with you. I'm such a huge fan of your work. Um, to start off, though, I'd love to talk about kind of um, your introduction to film music or to music in general mm. and how did it start in your life and what kind of what was the, the point where you're like moving towards film and television and all that stuff? I was kind of a very late starter. I, uh, I, um, I had like a first like tech startup. That's how I started my career in, like, mm. in the 80s, you know, when there was no startups. <laughs> um, and then uh, I quickly realized after a few years, actually, not that quickly, that it's not for me. I want to do the other side of, uh -huh. of things. And I always did music and I was actually did more film than music. And I, um, I just, you know, I found this uh, producer in Germany who, <laughs> who was in Mannheim, who was you know, doing amazing, amazing things. And then you know, went on to like contact him and just say, hey, can I, I don't know, make coffee and just start, yeah. I want to start over. Right. And that's how, I, how it all started a day was then. You know, at some point, in his, well, he had a recording studio and music production, did film music, he right. produced records. Shaka Khan was like the, the, the big thing. That's why I was like, oh my God, what's this guy <laughs> doing in Germany? So I, I got to see him. And so for some reason, he agreed that I could hang. Wow, that's <laughs> no, awesome. Yeah, I was completely <laughs> stoked. And I, um, yeah, I um, took like a, over, you know, the classic story overnight, some composer got, you know, he was sick, so they need to do commercial. and. Mm. I, I started at 10 p.m. and was finished at 6 a.m. <laughs> and you know, and, and from then on, I got into the writing mode of the uh, wow. Because yeah. you had some uh, on your IMDb some early things like Peter Strom, Tator, right. Der Eisbar, kind of early German television. Exactly. Right. So those were just kind of you get, kind of getting a grasp of like writing to picture because he didn't. It was like every an episode here and there, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are these are full. Um, I don't know exactly what the, I mean, I honestly don't remember, but no, I mean, <laughs> back in Germany, for that actually, you know, seemed from here, it doesn't matter, but mm -hmm. back in Germany, these were quite, you uh, know, um, quite notable yeah. achievements. Yeah, <laughs> I know, big, so big shows. But, but they were like, uh, like hot ort in Germany means something. Uh, it's like, right. I don't know, see, it's not even CSI. It's like a 90 minute, uh, it's a movie, every, yeah. every, it's movie of the week. Wow. But um, after a short while of, of doing this and, um, Having some, you know, challenges of being inspired there because mm. everyone was very, may I say, so middle of the road happy. You know, mm. they were happy with average stuff. And right. I want right. to do more, and it was actually difficult to do. But you know, give me two more days, I'll do it better. And, yeah, yeah. And um, so I always looked, of course, what I've been doing, what's been done here. Right. Yeah. And I just went on a vacation on like a little trip to say, you know, I just want to see what's going on. I want to see the bands playing in the clubs and the musicians I heard of. And, you know, <laughs> I went to, you know, to see uh, Bob Menser at the uh, Catalina, something like, wow. you know, these kind yeah. of... That was, by the way, almost the only 10 days I had for the rest of my life to actually go and enjoy music. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I haven't done so much. Uh, that one week, I remember that well, because now I realize, my God, after 20 years. Yeah. I have to go back out and, and, and get inspired again. And, and right, go, yeah, it's, and it's refreshing. It's such a big part of the process. And I know so many composers, I'll ask them, I was going to ask you at the end of it, but you know, what do you do in your pastime? They're like, I don't even remember the last vacation I took. Yeah, no, <laughs> so exactly. it just wraps into your life and becomes your life. Um, yeah. But growing up, did you have any kind of early inspirations of other musicians or other uh, composers or films that you gravitated towards and been like, oh, that speaks to me kind of? That was so interesting. I mean... Very early, on, I was very much into big band stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I listened to. I mean, we had like the Sammy Nestico jazz arrangements. We played wow. in big band. That was the first time actually I hit America too. Was with the big band of our high school, <laughs> <laughs> and we played some malls. You know, in Chicago. That's kind uh -huh. of how it started. Wow. Well, I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? We are. I felt really out of place because you know, the uh, musical education back in Germany is when it comes to. Um, what they call entertainment music. Mm -hmm. uh, they make you make a difference. They actually make a difference there between serious music and entertaining music. Okay, which is already so like concert pieces yeah, versus versus yeah. like you know movie music right. with versus big band jazz and, yeah, yeah. and, and rock pop, uh, which tells you a lot about you know how <laughs> how hard it is to actually create yeah. something that because you only serious, yeah. get really uh, regarded and acknowledged if you you know pop stars are looked down. 
uh-huh. and jazz doesn't exist really. I mean, that's a trip, you know. Yeah. And many things have changed over the last two years, but right. when I was there, it was like really hard to uh, get anything, and uh, you know, in terms of acting and movies and, and directing. It, you had to work long and hard to find one light at the end of the tunnel somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I did a lot of stuff over there, and uh, I'm not saying I was like a, a top player at the time, but yeah. I did a lot of stuff there. And um, and, uh, and again, you had to do like ten things you like didn't believe in to get the chance to do one thing that meant something. Which to you. Meant something. Yeah. So when you're starting out as a composer, I mean, you're obviously accomplished now, and you 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 have an identity and a sound. But I always like to uh, ask composers like, when you're first starting out, is there a process, time where you're like well, what is my sound going to be? Like, am I going to be an electronic composer, orchestral? Totally. Or, I mean, did yeah. you kind of have a, I guess, an identity crisis at the beginning to try to determine, like, what is a Klaus Bedell score going to sound like? Interesting question. No, actually, not at all. I, mm-hmm. I, um, I always kind of did that thing. It, it's, um, but also what helped, I did, like, tons of commercials back in Germany. Right. And then even here. A lot of composers came. do that. As a, yeah, as so as I like, did hundreds of them. Yeah. And I tried all kinds of, I had to, you know, tried all kinds of styles. And, right. And I came from, you know, in, uh, from pop record production. It was used right. to call records at the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, produced them and, and um and did a lot of recordings and um, so I had this always uh, um, this this uh, I came from the very um, you know the approachable angle of like pop and, and, and if you want jazz stuff right but I always had this love on the other hand for you know Mahler was one of my I mean right. I, there's nothing else I really listen to is actually these these mm-hmm. nine and a half symphonies and um, the, the big symphonic work and uh, and a variety of, of stuff, like singer songwriters, all these things and merged together. So I always was this guy at the synthesizer. Right. Um, but also I loved it, the appreciation of, of the orchestra. Yeah. Um, I learned a little bit, but not formally. I actually, in fact, failed the entry exam of uh, what I wanted to do in, back in Germany. Wow. Yes. So um, didn't want me. And um, I, uh, I, you know, I didn't want to be this concert pianist kind yeah, of style yeah. too. I want to produce and record. And, Right. What was offered there is uh, on an ec- educational basis, mm-hmm. uh, very different than here. You yeah. know? Again, that was 20 years ago, so I actually don't even know what's going on there right now. Yeah. But, but here you had many more, you have many more opportunities to learn recording technology and, right. and songwriting and jazz and pop and film music. When right, right. Started, of course. So, I mean, when you came to Los Angeles, I mean, it's such a... Uh, I mean, it's such a bigger pool, a bigger pond than, than versus anywhere else in the world. Unimaginable. I know, it's just, it's overwhelming. When I moved out here, you know, it's just like, what? You know, you come from this little sheltered bubble and then you're like, here. So when you, I mean, you started, or, you know, of course you worked with Hans and Media Ventures and all that, but um, when you started getting those early works uh, as an additional composer, was that kind of, I mean, is that was that the only way to really learn Hollywood was through kind of that kind of method of working under it was it was a dream come true I Mm -hmm. don't even uh, I would never complain Um, yeah this was more than I ever dreamt of besides when I came here um, you know I got here literally on vacation just to check out musicians and you know I fell into a couple of places like one was Hans Zimmer's place Uh, Mm -hmm. I had no idea you can't do that yeah Um, (laughs) and I just showed up and they probably mixed me up because I had this like barely spoke English, uh-huh. and uh, they thought I must know him. I mean, he must know me. I don't uh-huh. know, something crazy. Just a German and association or something. <laughs> I don't know, for some reason something something went wrong and I got in. <laughs> and I uh, was basically offered, not a job, but like an internship, that's mm-hmm. what I asked for. Yeah. And they want to keep me there. So uh, for me, it was like, I didn't even know if I was actually able and capable of doing this. It's a very, it, it doesn't come easy um, yeah. to me. The, the writing it's it's hard work and not only work it's like questioning it's psychologically very difficult yeah uh, it's not like yeah here I am what can I do <laughs> yeah um, it's more the opposite and um, to be able to s- just sit on the couch behind uh, you know I, li- I had this with Mark Shaman too uh, for a while right and yeah. Hans and uh, Michael Kamen I uh, was you know um, I could work with um, definitely definitely with Hans the most of the time and right. in the composers uh, yeah uh, John Powell and uh, Harry Gregson Williams. I remember at the beginning. Yeah, you worked on The Hunger, I think, didn't you? Oh yes, yeah. exactly with Harry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I was, of course, the intern who was, you know, one of the many. And boy, that was a high, uh, high competition there. Oh, I can't uh, imagine. <laughs> I've, I've talked to I've talked to John Powell and Harry at the time. Yeah. And they've said, yeah, it's a, it was a very competitive situation. But, yeah. but it is. I mean, at the same time, they opened their studio doors to me more right. or less. And, 
I will never forget that. And again, I was sitting in the back and just listening what they do and like wondering the more they did, like, oh my gosh, will I ever be able to do this? This is there was this scene and they're like, I would have no idea what to do at this point. Uh -huh. Only to learn when they turn around and talk then that they're feeling the same. Right. And they're still <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, there's terror on their face. Uh, they're ter yeah, they're terrorized. <laughs> Uh, terrified. I mean, yeah. for like, and I, I really didn't. And it just, you know, <laughs> oh, I'm glad you. Like, I'm not the only one. Kind of. Right. And so it was amazing for me to be able to be asked to like, hey, can you? I'm leaving at midnight. Can you do something till mm. when I come back? Like, oh, really? I really, sure, sure. So this was uh, crazy. So yeah. I, for me, it wasn't like I have to work under someone. Oh, for me, it was like the highest I could ever achieve. Yeah. And, and then it went on from there. And you got to and collaborate with so many people. I think collaboration is such a key part yeah. of music and everything and you got to work with Hans and, exactly. and Ramin and all these amazing composers yeah, exactly. and one of your early scores which Hans what I really love was um, uh, The Pledge which you did for Sean Penn yeah. and um, I was always curious as it was, it's such a great film and he doesn't direct that often I and mean, he's an actor what was it like working with a I guess a director who was also an actor but he, I mean, he wasn't in the film he was just behind the, yeah, the camera yeah um, oh my gosh I'll, I had only 10 days for that score or wow. something like this I was less than two weeks and we were living off coffee and, and, yeah. and wine you know yeah mixed it. together something yes. like <laughs> um, and he was already mixing dubbing the film in, wow. in San Francisco so he came at night um, listened to the stuff gave some notes and then made sure he would go back to the hotel before the bar closing <laughs> Exaggerating, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, he was in such an inspiration. These guys yeah. are an amazing inspiration. I mean, he probably doesn't still know who the guy was who was sitting in the console. That was me because mm -hmm. it was such a blur. Yeah, just um, watched, but yeah. but it was uh, with him was um, he you know he's a he's a kind of a film teacher if you want. He yeah. told me what the scene was about. I'm like, oh. This is very different than my impression. Yeah. So I was just this young guy who like thought, oh, there's a love scene, score a love scene. He's like, no, this is not a love scene, but I see it. Okay. You know, yeah. So to um, kind of get the, the you learn reading between the lines and the yeah. 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 And uh, and I'm just curious about that. I mean, you're talking about your approach, not just for uh, the pledge, but for any film. Uh, now that you've kind of mastered that, when you sit down and look at the film for the first time, or you look at the script, or whenever you're part of the process, what's like the first thing that I guess starts communicating to you as a as the storyteller do you look at the characters do you look at the maybe the cinematography the plot like what's kind of that pulls the first note out when a movie is like the quintessential uh you know multimedia show mm, right? right so it's actually everything sometimes it is like the how the even the camera works so yeah how this has been shot uh, how the camera tells the story but it's mostly the it's mostly how i connect with the lead or with the character the main character it's yeah. really like how does it feel and uh, it's my actually role often the very first 10 minutes of the film if you have that maybe five right to make the audience feel sympathetic even though you know whatever the guy is but to feel for them because once you feel with them and right. for them you can do the story can take you anywhere and you believe it yeah it can be the most unbelievable story after yeah it could be an action movie but action is no fun if you don't feel for the character if you don't, yeah, you don't, don't care for, for what's going to happen yeah right. Uh, then I feel it's a cold action. I, I don't care then. And I think the audience, most of them, will feel the same. Right. And do you pull from, when you're pulling emotion, and whether it's something, a painful scene or a death scene or even a happy, really you know, crying happiness, are you trying to analyze the characters kind of? I mean, it's a kind of psychological thing to figure out what the mm. character is thinking. Or do you try to pull, like, okay, I've experienced this myself, you know, mm. in my life. And do you pull from experience of yourself? Oh, yeah. Or do you yeah, just. There's there's a lot of that if you're lucky, of course. Yeah, you can I mean, really personally connect yeah. uh, with you know a certain situation in the film, mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, everyone has their their mother story, the father story, right. and you know you you like um, just getting close. But it's more um, it's more how do you how it, it's always trying to find the one thing you want to say with the scene. Yeah, and sometimes across certain scenes. I mean, right, had movies where. Um, I tell one example where, uh, which doesn't happen a lot. That's why I remember it. Uh, you have we had this I don't know almost eight minute scene where two two story um, sort of intercut, mm -hmm. very difficult and, and conceptually, and I had no idea how to solve this until the editor of that film um, cut in the theme I had written, and this which was like. If you want to gloss over the whole, but tie it together. Right. Anyway, I would have never honestly written it to picture because I, I, I would be too close. Right. So to step back some, and then that would just under, 
we'll just color everything, give it the mm. right, oh, this all makes sense now. Thing. Right, right. Versus the you scoring the scene or even the yeah. two, you know, or even the step back. So yeah. which film was that? Do you um, remember? That was Ned Kelly. Oh wow, that's uh, that's a, one of my favorite scores. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's. <laughs> But that, that that doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's a rare gem. Yeah, but and it's a beautiful, beautiful film. Yeah, like, yeah absolutely. No matter, I mean, I don't even touch. I don't have to touch it. It's beautiful. So yeah. it's, uh, I'm not saying it's good music, but these are great opportunities. We were just talking about you know working with Sean Penn, um, another amazing director. That I mean, your your career, you've worked with so many amazing directors. But Werner Herzog is, I think, I mean, one of my favorite directors. You know, inspiring me as a filmmaker. And I mean, you did Invincible with him, and Rescue Dawn, Queen of the Desert. Um, how is what is Werner like as a director? I mean, he's such a big personality. I mean, he's one of the few directors where you see him speak and he's in front of the camera, he's acting, and Jack Reacher, he's you know. <laughs> so, yeah, he's well, he's a character. Yeah, and he's always his own character in a way. Um, I remember Invincible was. I had so much respect for that guy, of course. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I actually was afraid of him. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, he too pointed a gun at his <laughs> exactly. another class. Uh, another class. He, another he class. Yeah. Another class. So I didn't want to be the second one. <laughs> Um, his, I remember Invincible watching it without any music only he put some Beethoven in mm. and that was the first movie I ever cried without having any piece of music I mean like a temp not even not even a temp there was nothing in yeah, it I think just the, um, the, just, just the movie I was uh, in tears and, um, and it wasn't finished at all and it was a mm -hmm. production sound and you could hear people talk it, it would drag me in so much and um, no, he was the opposite of what you would expect. Really, yeah. what I expected at least. Uh -huh. um, he was so respectful of the work. He would not interfere with details, but instead inspire you to a to get to a higher level. Uh, okay. He would just talk about. I don't even know. I don't even know. He wouldn't say this needs to be there and there needs to be a change. That was all obvious. Yeah. Uh, it it was more like offer me something. Mm -hmm. And I offered him, uh, I spotted it, and I said, I think it should, what do you think? Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, yeah. And then he would call um, and ask, hey, uh, I'm on the stage because I was still writing. I moved, I moved this like by three seconds. Is that okay with you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to ask me. That's the first one who ever would. Wow. Um, <laughs> so no, uh, very respectful. And I think you can see this. He even sometimes he put the music up, I thought, too loud, too prominent. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, it was written more like uh, you know it should sneak on, uh, right. should sneak in on you, and he uh, he even used it as a piece of music. So this is where that that's the only thing I ever thought like hey, I'm I'm uh, honored, but he, yeah, he can he can push it down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the, the my the scene that's you know st sticks with me is the opening credits for Rescue Dawn, and that's mm. the way you scored it. I mean, I remember from our, mm. it's been a while since I've seen it, but it was I remember it's a kind of a, a helicopter shot of explosions, yeah. Yeah, and it's, and then you kind of scored it with this beautiful, yeah, I mean, yeah. melancholic <laughs> type piece that was like yeah. counter of what we're seeing. You're looking, you're looking at, you're turning war into something beautiful for a second there. Yeah, yeah. it's a bit, it's the bigger meaning, of course. Of um, I mean these. The footage he found, and he always does this, was yeah. just uh, breathtaking. You know, it had a certain beauty, may I say, yeah. to it. Actually, yeah. the footage was like, you know, it was the the beauty of destruction is right. terrible. Yeah, that's um, interesting. Yeah. But what, of course, what I was trying to play is this. Um, I'm telling the end of the story while he's telling the beginning. Mm. I'm telling it where we all going with this and what this means to. Hopefully us, but right, definitely to right. the story and the character who's in there, who, you know, is this true story of this guy. Yeah, of course. He was actually researching the uh, Dieter Dengler uh, at the yeah. time um, while I was doing Invincible. And uh, Dieter actually passed away at the time wow. when we were dubbing. Uh, um, and so he, he uh, actually he did the documentary about him too. Yeah, first. he did. Yeah, yeah. And when I was reading his, I don't know what it was, a treatment or something mm -hmm. in red. I thought like you can't make this up. Nobody would make this movie. It yeah. sounds too contrived. Right. But this was all true of this guy who dreamt to be a pilot, and he saw this pilot's eye flying by, and yeah. and then he was okay as a little boy, and then he was like, "I'm gonna do it." Wow. He failed everything, went to America, <laughs> had this dream, and then the first flight he did, he was shot down. Yeah. And, and, and the story just keeps going on and on and on. Right. And possibilities one after another. So this is actually the the beauty of life, you know. Yeah. And sometimes you have to. You don't get the opportunity every time, but exactly. Yeah. And this, the Werner, you can try. And also, I try to uh, um, 
it's a, I think I love that co- collaboration so much because I can he pushes me definitely but mm. I can push him a little bit too I can Which ask great, musical yeah. questions I can say hey would you be open for this it's a bit not what you probably would do expect or anything right yeah. like slightly slightly just push it this way and, right. and he's super open and then he says also like ah that doesn't work because I'm like okay I totally disagree but <laughs> You know what? When I look back a week later, I'm like, yeah, he's totally right. right. It's a stupid idea. <laughs> but um, he um, he accepts more than I ever thought he would. Uh, yeah. Being such a, uh, a experienced filmmaker, for you know, has done so much. So, I mean, yeah, his entire career. And then the, the, the recent one that he did a few years ago was Queen of the Desert, which. What? I don't know what happened to that movie. Did it, uh, it, did it never get distributed? I don't know. It was such a huge thing with Nicole Kidman and Robert Pattinson. I mean, it's a finished film, right? You scored it? Yeah, yeah it's finished. It's yeah. a beautiful film, I think. It's a beautiful film. I had lots of opportunities also to record right. like, beautiful, beautiful vocalists and, and instruments and yeah. a lot of research about uh, music of, of the era. Um, I worked on so many pictures which you don't know what happened to them. Yeah, it's so and interesting. They don't deserve that um, for one or the other reason. Right. It's when when this kind of filmmaking um, clashes with, the business. let's say, the distribution yeah. industry or whatnot. Right. Oh, business. Yeah. yeah. It's it's twofold, and you know, if you accept both. Yeah, and yeah. I've done mainstream movies a lot, and that's what they do. And then right. you get other <laughs> things from the other. It's you know if you make movies today, I think you just have to accept it. Yeah, it's part of the just part of the, the, the yeah. craft. <laughs> yeah. well, I hope it gets released, or I hope your score gets released. I think it was released outside. I think it was America? released very. Um, I mean, it played at festivals and yeah. and I think limited distribution, but it never got a U.S. release. So I don't even on the home. Video. What I love about Vernus also is is um, is I remember here there's this theater in Santa Monica, the Arrow, mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah. Um, they often have uh, filmmakers live on stage and then when the film shows. And when Werner was there last time, every now and then he does this. I uh, forgot which movie they're showing. Th- Fitzcarraldo or something. Mm-hmm. My like most favorite film of all times, I think. And uh, he, the, the audience was not the mm, nerdy uh, 50 plus uh, years old, you know, uh, melancholic, oh, remember those movies? Yeah. No, these were all young and hungry filmmakers. Right. I mean, they were uh, in that. 20s and teens, you know, yeah. most of them, they were coming from film school, or are in film school, you could see the audience, and those are his fans, and that is to me, That's he like speaks it. to these, uh, to, to these, to every age, it's pure filmmaking, still. Yeah. it's not um, a, a catalog, a back catalog. Right, yeah, I mean, it's, and he still, he's such a powerful presence today, even today, like his films, his yeah. documentary work is still yeah. fantastic. Um, it's just to go down the list of the movie directors where Kurt <laughs> Wimmer, is another amazing, oh, yeah. yeah, Kurt, who did, you did Equilibrium Ultraviolet with, and I always found those scores to be very interesting, because Kurt's films are so, uh, or at least those two films are so hyper-stylized, I mean, totally. r- ridiculous over-the-top stylized, <laughs> uh, so when that, when you have a visual style like that, that is coming at you, and kind of overshadows everything to make it, you know, does the score need to match it in, in terms of style, in terms of trying to be something like... over top? No, it's just sometimes you, you just play it straight, um, mm-hmm. in this case, I... Uh, no, I actually played it very straight and very serious. I mean, it was very, yeah, was very, uh, uh, you know, um, very uh, Third Reich. Was <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, um, no, no, the I played March, it. Very, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want, it's exaggerated, but no, it didn't feel to be exaggerated. <laughs> um, it felt like you know, it, it wants this kind of yeah. old statement of how they see themselves. You 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 slip right. into the bubble they, the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, my gosh, uh, I love Kurtz. Kurt's writing and his ideas, and he's actually he's an excellent filmmaker, and um, I hope he's going to do more directing too. Yeah, not just writing. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. He does. He does. He's yeah, writing and, and directing too. Not good um, again, another uh, more action guys you worked with was Richard Donner, John McTiernan, yeah. Wolfgang Peterson. Yeah, um, you know, with Sixteen Blocks and Poseidon and Basic. For Poseidon, though, I'm very interested. It's such a you know the disaster film. You know, it's kind of a big genre. And when you think of ships and disasters, of course, you think of Titanic. And right. and so when you were making that film, what was the I guess the key to making something that would be entertaining? I guess to see people in peril, I guess be an yeah. as form yeah. of entertainment. You know. Yeah. No. I mean, we, we one thing we said I remember was not to make a remake of it, but mm-hmm. you know to define a new you know, what we would do today. Right. Because there was a film. In the Poseidon Adventure. Yeah. The original. Adventure, yeah. But it's if you look at it, it's a very yeah, very different vibe. Of very, course. yeah. <laughs> and um, 
you no, know, it was always to find actually the individual characters which drive it. Mm-hmm. And there was a whole cast, right? And each of them were parallel stories and they come together. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and basically it was just, you know, run. Yeah. <laughs> run, 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 run all the time. Right. Uh, and it's hard to actually keep the tension and keep the pace yeah. up uh, because you're running all the time. And the, and the film goes from like from start to finish. Yeah, that's so cute. And when the movie when they escape is when it ends. There's really just like boom, boom, like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I try to find in these uh, transcendental moments, these these moments where I mean there was this underwater scene of uh, um, which c- you need these emotional uh, centerpieces. Yeah. And uh, and often is is great at that. He enables you to do this. He actually puts this in. Right. And you just have to follow. Yeah. <laughs> Another big uh, film of yours, of course, is Pirates of the Caribbean, and um, that movie came out from Disney based on a ride. No one knew it was going to be a success or anything, and I didn't even know the ride, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it was just this thing. Gore Verbinski, you know. Uh, so I, I spoke with Alan Silvestri, and he kind of talked me oh. through it, and mm. and how you know he and didn't he didn't write anything. I moved off, and um, so I'm just curious um, if we if we can talk about it, just what, what was the process on that film? I know that it was kind of a, a last second dash to the finish. Yeah. And, and what was it like? I know I have a lot of stories of Jerry Bruckheimer and, and working with him, but what was that like for you and, and at a time in your career? Yeah, it was crazy. I, I, um, uh, I basically, Anne Silvestri, by the way, was one of my, well, is one of my biggest heroes, one of mm-hmm. the reasons I'm actually here. Yeah. Um, I had not heard anything. I'm not sure if he, if he told you he didn't write anything good. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's always highly political. There's so many reasons so, yeah, things happen. Business, but politics, yeah. Right, look, I mean, if a guy like Anne Silvestri... Uh, you know, gets this treatment. Mm-hmm. You can imagine what happens to me and others. So, yeah. So uh, it was definitely not an easy project because it had like no time, thirty days or something from wow. I think to the trucks waited to deliver the the rolls to wow. the theaters. Wow. From the day I saw it, and uh, there was this established relationship with Hans. Hans didn't have time to do it, uh, and, and Bruckheimer. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure with Gore, but but there was a lot of going on. So I just and all I could do is like, dive in. Mm-hmm. And, and just do 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 and we uh, had a lot of help obviously because yeah. we came to this the movie was cut down 20 minutes was cut out while I was working on it and you know, whole reel wow <laughs> uh, so there was a complete madness I almost <laughs> barely remember it was really like a very blurry time right um, but sometimes you know it's not the experience I mean there are movies in which I had a much hmm, more fulfilling experience doing of course it. yeah and here the experience, the fulfilling experience comes after. In fact, you like you can't believe that actually you created this. Yeah. When you, when you dive up, right? Like, oh, that's what came out. Amazing. Right. And, uh, wow. All right. Um, but also, what was cool about it was that it wasn't, you know, uh, like the the the, uh, the classic pirate kind of music and movie. Yeah. It was very different. It was more, you know, rock and roll with orchestra. Kind yeah, of exactly. And it, was like a, it was almost like a Western very Exactly. Yeah. It was like the guy, you know, he doesn't get the girl too. It's so super weird things yeah, happening yeah, in the yeah. movie. Very and gorgeous. Boy, yeah. We were like, everybody was scared. Like, this was a big production and right. this didn't look like it's going to work out. Yeah. <laughs> most of the time. We had right. several editors. You can imagine the madness. Yeah. 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 I mean, and then of course it's, spawned off an entire franchise and everything right yeah which no one I think saw coming either <laughs> no 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 but and it gave me the opportunity then to mm, I um to um while they were then continue to do two three four five six seven I don't even know how many are, mm. are there right now but I and had the opportunity to work in the shadow of that of the first right to work with all these amazing directors I uh, uh who you know, I mean, Bizarre was like, a, uh, I think the first six months after it came out or three months, yeah. I didn't get a single call. <laughs> I, was, I was jobless. Yeah. Like, huh? How can that happen after <laughs> moving? I mean, if you like it or not, but it was successful, right? Right, Whatever. yeah. Um, and then I started working with, you know, Wolfgang Peterson, uh, with yeah. the Dick Donner, I think. Yeah, Richard Lappin. Donner and 16 Blocks. And 16, and all yeah. came after, yeah. And uh, who I John went, McTiernan, yeah. John McTiernan. Um, that was a crazy... Um, story too uh, then with uh, uh, Shane Kaige the Chinese director yes. I spent then a long time um, with uh, him in China The Promise The Promise yeah, so all this in basically in the in the shadow of this big um, mainstream film right um, anyway I mean you never know what 
turns out yeah what you just never know yeah. well did the did the whole experience of that the politics and stuff did that just kind of sour you from it is that why you pulled away from the franchise did you want to explore no more no, no. there was i mean hans had this pre-established relationship with jerry and jerry mm. was one just hans you know? yeah i know that's what i was and hearing I, hans, you know yeah. i had uh, it was an uphill battle but i mm-hmm. hope i did fine and yeah and i have no i mean i actually really admire jerry uh, um, yeah. because he was more on top than you ever would think you know i remember playbacks and we were all like you know on our last cylinder but yeah he would remember what i played him back the week before in minute eight you know so he was he was on top of things right you couldn't just cheat it out yeah you know, he's, cheat, again, his productions are you know tight ship yeah. no it's a tight, tight ship yeah, yeah tight ship <laughs> and you had to invent something new so it was very difficult and mm-hmm. i give a lot of credit to all the ones i helped who helped me on this too you know yeah all these which then some of them turned on to be uh, turned out to be like great composers on their own because they they were yeah so it's it's this sometimes it happens that right. you have to um, just dive through and and to write 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 I mean I was writing I was not on the, I don't think I was on a single recording session you know I was wow. writing all the time that's I mean the, that time limit was kind of crazy yeah. um, and you met, you just mentioned John McTiernan and basic as an interesting story so yeah. how, how did that come to be and, and I mean his, him as a you know, as a director I mean we know him in the news and everything and yeah. what happened <laughs> to him yeah. but like at the time when you're making the film and this is a guy who gave us Die huge. Hard yeah. yeah I mean he gave us I mean, he, his, um, uh, that was it. Yeah, blanking. It? yeah no, exactly. Um, well, just the so Thomas Crown Affair, his remake of Thomas, Thomas Crown Affair. Right. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. Kurt Rimmer's script, by the way. Yeah, yeah so there you go. fantastic. Right, exactly. So what was yeah. basic like in working with this kind of top-tier action director? Oh, my goodness. I, I was super, um, I mean, it was a weird situation with him, I have to admit, because he never really showed up. Hmm. Yeah, I had like a, a handful of meetings with him. And then he showed up again at the end when everything was al- almost done. <laughs> and I was, it, honestly, I can say I was disappointed. I was <laughs> looking forward to work with this hero of mine <laughs> and who created like, the most iconic pictures. And um, I had understanding issues with the film. I didn't like, well, why is this happening, John? And you wouldn't pick up the phone. Um, so uh, it was a bit weird, I have to say. Yeah. And, but also there was this amazing editor on this too. So we worked, I mean, we worked together ultimately, but... Uh, not as close as I always. I like to work very close with directors. Yeah, and there was this amazing editor who, uh, you know, he, he did. You know, so iconic. He did um, um, Blues Brothers. You know, mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have this kind of team. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my god. <laughs> uh, like, oh, and then me. What's going on? And um, so, so uh, that that was a lot of fun. But I, um, I wasn't really part of the development of the film because I came in also very late. And, yeah. And John had moved off almost already you know. um, so I enjoy more when I can be really part of it of yeah editorial. when you just felt kind of floating on your own to yeah I'm, yeah I'm not that kind of guy give me the tape and then yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the drive or right. download <laughs> and uh, I score it for you and I show it to you when I'm you know have the themes and next yeah. time I come back on the scoring stage right don't like that I like to be really involved in the cutting room and, and everything not even talking about music but talking about everything yeah just the, the story and everything i mean because yeah. you, you're all storytellers in the end that's the thing like Thank your you, job yeah. is music right. storytelling that person right. is cutting the picture storytelling right. i mean and i think that's an important part of separate film composers from other types of musicians is storytelling <laughs> right right exactly, yeah, um, sure. that's exactly another right. interesting project of yours was uh, constantine yeah uh, which you co-composed with brian tyler which okay. uh, but i don't think you guys work together right was it a well, you know, we, we, we were did, overlapping it, in a way, but it was like, yeah, also one of those crazy, crazy things. He had started it mm-hmm. and I, well, I won't say I finished it, but I, um, <laughs> I, I won't say I took over, but it, there was part of stuff he did and then and there weren't other things right. differently. And the director threw himself fully, like took full charge and said, like, it was my fault. But we need some new direction for certain scenes or like the rest of the film. Right. So, uh, um, I know, thank you for yeah, and um, <laughs> um, and he, by the way, he works very differently to me for, as far as I understand. Right. In terms of how he writes. Oh, Brian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a cool guy. I love Brian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a very different way. I mean, like literally, like the, the the craftsmanship of writing is yeah. very different too. So I know that's why it was interesting because you guys are so stylistically work. so different. Yeah. yeah we could, not only that, but also really like the like you yeah. know how do we create? Right. It's cr- almost incompatible to actually work <laughs> together. Right. You know, you would the you know he writes very different in pro two. I don't know if he still does, but at the mm-hmm. time. And I was very hands-on with the orchestration. So he, um, um, anyways, but it's very inspiring then to have someone with a very different perspective on yeah. it. Yeah. And uh, then the director was 
said, okay, now I'm really set free. We have to rethink and you have two weeks. <laughs> And I come back after Christmas. No, he was there, but like, everyone else came back after Christmas. Yeah. So, wow. That's um, yeah. Composers, <laughs> yeah, you do finish. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you also worked with, uh, which I think is a, a very special score. I mean, I really love it as Beat the Drum. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. With Ramin. Ramin did yeah. a lot of that, actually. And, yeah. And we worked together. But uh, um, yeah, that was um, the South African theme. And yeah. Um, and I love the choir that it, the recorded in this church. And you know, there's a very, the exact opposite end. You know, Constantine was a hundred X million dollar yeah. movie where you, um, right. you know, you see the visual effects develop in front of your eyes. Yeah. And there it's the most inspiring in that film to me was, you know, one of the most inspiring was this, the beautiful songs they actually recorded on site. Similar yeah. to Thin Red Line, I had done this like right. you know, years before. And that's one of my favorite films. And you took mm. kind of the Melanesian chants and you kind of adapted it into the, the melodies of the fit, fabric of the score, right? Yeah. Is that what the idea was there? Exactly right. Yeah. Like make this like a song for orchestra and choir. And mm. also technically it was very difficult because yeah. these guys were singing and the pitch was drifting over time. It's like, how, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and how do you, add, you know. But it's, it's beautiful when you have uh, the opportunity to get um, different vocabulary outside your yeah. usual. In the choir recording authentic from the Solomon Islands and here from um, somewhere in, in South Africa mm -hmm. I don't know where that was um, in some church amateur choir but oh so heartfelt and beautiful so wow. you have to just add enough to to make it a bit maybe more accessible yeah and you did some there's some vocals uh, vocal chants in in the time machine I think right oh yeah right yeah, yeah. And I built this actually there was like a single singer Mm -hmm. and I built she was amazing and I, I built this track by track by track with her um, to create this very um, non-traditional choir and then we had yeah. the the choir choir sing it and it mm -hmm. didn't sound that right mm -hmm. uh, so we mixed it again with what I had built to not have um, it sound like a church choir you right know, the opposite then you know yeah. to create something new with it too and, and i love always when you have the opportunity again to have outside vocabulary like uh, instruments you know uh, in china so i love the well, yeah so the promise was such a i mean you so you went over there and you did the whole score there in china the whole score i i spent not only writing the scores so the director sent me you know i wrote the first few at a couple of three weeks developing some themes mm -hmm. sitting at the lake in uh, Hangzhou uh, literally I'm in my writing room he put me up there and then he came and listens it's very nice but I think I'll send you around China a little bit more to wow. absorb I'm like okay that's good <laughs> criticism so I I spent uh, I don't know weeks and weeks um, and he made some calls and I was swimming in ice cold lakes at 7 in the morning with the governor of Yunnan you know and wow and things like this, uh, high in the mountains with museums of musical instruments they found, they don't even know how to play them. Wow. Uh, chants and dances done just for me. I have so many recordings. Yeah. And I did a lot of research with instruments um, I had never seen before. So that's when my love to China started. Um, that was almost, you know, almost 15 years ago. I know, but I mean, that, that's to me, that's like the epitome of what you do. I mean, you take another culture and you mm -hmm. translate it into music like that. I mean, that must have been such a rewarding oh, I think, experience for you. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. I, I, I think you can hear it in the in the movie that also, you know, uh, Shane Kaige's um, personality, you just yeah. want to be as good as he is, uh, remotely. You know, he can never be as good as he is, but right. you want to rise to the occasion with him. Absolutely. And, and you, I think you can hear the inspiration. Yeah, for sure. And um, so, talking about China, a recent film that's coming out, uh, Warrior's Gate. Yeah. Uh, it's, it takes place in it's China. It's not out yet. I didn't know it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming out. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, the score comes out soon, too. I think. That's a cool film. I, yeah. I, have to, I can totally. Great director, a uh, young new guy. Um, and uh, it's really cool because it has this kind of video game um, yeah, aesthetics. It's a, yeah, it's a video game about a, a young kid who gets transported to, to China, yeah, right? A totally cool idea, I thought, likewise. Yeah. Nobody else ever do it. Luc Besson, I think, did the story. Luc Besson did the story. Yeah. Uh, but, wow. <laughs> And it's really it's really done well. Um, the, the 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 characters really click. Mm -hmm. I think. Hopefully, the audience is the same. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun because also you could do two things at the same time. It yeah. was very electronic, very um, ethnic at the same time. Right. Lots of action, but also um, you know, like teenager romance, if you want, mm -hmm. between in the future or in some other world between two cultures. Like mm -hmm. you could do everything you wanted. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think the movie was uh, just a lot of fun and that's also I love you know you yeah. can see I love mainstream stuff like that which is right. really well done and I think that one was very well done and it's very well done yeah. and uh, 
in a lot of you know Werner Herzog and other you know you might think more substantial but for me there's substance in and every, all of these kinds. Absolutely. I mean, I think your career has been so varied and different, especially, um, I mean, like, one of your one of my favorite sports is War of the Buttons. They did. Oh, thank the, you. The oh, you know about it. Thank yeah, you. The, and then uh, The Prodigies. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. a great action score. And then, yeah. Um, so, yeah, but talking about that time of your career, I call it the kind of the Klaus French New Wave, where you. Yeah. Well, I don't know. How did that happen? I don't how know. How did you become this big kind of French composer for I French cinema? <laughs> I, I, I remember I was on the plane once and I watched a French movie and I thought this was one of the best movies I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, I want to do some French movies. And besides I love Paris, I don't want to go as a tourist. Okay, I called some people and said, can yeah. you help me introduce me to some people? And from then on, I went to France like for years, uh, every couple of weeks. Wow. To, uh, 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 and, um, and I ended up like having a baguette on my knees and no time to actually <laughs> see anything in Paris. Yeah. But, um, and I had the opportunity really to work with beautiful, there's a very different way of working with directors there. Yeah. And you have much more freedom if you want, I don't know. Well, um, because that's where I think the auteur theory started. I think yeah. France still holds the director as the prime visionary. And, you know, we did too in America, in American New Wave. And I think just recently we had the surge in franchises and studio pictures and where the producer kind of rose back up to like, producers as the king and the right. director is doing what the producer says but sure. it, so I think it probably was more freeing over there to see to work with creative visionaries like that yeah and I got to do uh, you know it's uh, typecasting so mm -hmm. you got, I got to do things which for some reason I wouldn't do here I did comedies yeah I mean I did like romantic iconic, comedies yeah. yeah iconic French comedies mm -hmm. I, I mean the, not the uh, properties like uh, Little Nick or Petit Nicolas which yeah. was like I'm like oh, you're asking me I'm the German from Hollywood you want me to do this right I mean they have like you won't believe in the uh, in Paris exhibitions about these books and yeah and it's one of the highest and that was um, anyway I'm saying of course I can do it yeah. uh, that's not the point it's right. just like, like oh, it's thank you for trusting me this yes. um, because there's so many who would probably be more have, yeah. in the background of have, have shown it before mm -hmm. so in this then it enabled me to do you know comedies and here you know it comes around like through New York and back it's um, I just love not doing the same thing I did last time yeah do you ever I mean and you've done some different regions of France and China and America mm. um, do you ever feel like an outsider like you, you feel like <laughs> always you, like you don't belong <laughs> yeah. always I'm always the outsider yeah. um, and I'm here for, I'm this German in uh, in Hollywood so that's the yeah. outsider if you want I'm right. the I'm the Hollywood guy in, in France and like, I had like Trust me, I had meetings where they say, oh, well, we don't like the American way of filmmaking. Like, mm. all right, I might not be the right one. <laughs> but you know the American way and you know what not to do, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And the same in China where, I mean, I was so honored to tell you, and I will always say this, uh, when the promise came out and, uh, and the director told me, look, he said, everything has been criticized. Uh, the story, <laughs> the visual effects, um, but nobody's criticizing the music. And that was my biggest fear that this... Right. Hollywood arrogant guy comes to China mm. and it was very early on this was 2004 or 5 yeah um, there was not much I mean today we have many more co-productions there yes. was much yes. worse and it's yeah. the first time where you think ah uh, that we have this uh, cultural imperialism um, mm. yeah. element and I didn't you know I had the highest respect and I was very honored that they realized uh, that the message came across that right. I don't want to impose myself on it but just to open this up to the rest of the world absolutely same with the uh, Olympics where yeah. I was kind of the I think I was the last white guy left you know <laughs> yeah. uh, last western uh, right. left on the project because um, it's very tricky it was especially tricky because which Olympics were those I forget the Beijing Olympics yes. in 2008, 2008 I did the closing ceremony so I know, those I know are three years of wow of uh, meetings and creation at night and then meeting in the day and then many many travels yeah I think and, uh, Jeff Rona worked on some of it there too yeah like, I heard later he told like, me yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but just to be yeah just to be involved in that and then creating something for a culture and a, and a nation I think that's a it's fascinating I mean it's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so um, beyond um, uh, filmmaking and beyond story and uh, music music Composing and all and storytelling, uh, you have I mean, you have other ventures and, and you just talking about how you started off. Mm -hmm. uh, we're sitting here in this office space for your company Kino Nation, which you co-founded. 
and uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in this kind of venture of your career now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, uh, I always do what I feel like doing, mm -hmm. and I never think about career. I remember when I went to China, people, uh, when I came back, people said, told me, oh, I thought you had moved away. I'm like, no, I just did a movie. But um, <laughs> yeah. but it's very, you know, yeah, there's this image of we have to fulfill. Mm. Um, this is political. What I, and I'm not saying I don't care, I mean, you have to play the game a bit. But I always like like to do what I like to do. Yeah. And then in this point, in this moment, I um, at this moment I saw this opportunity of like, look, we're having this revolution, this paradigm shift going on out there, mm -hmm. when, when everything is shifting from, you know, I say DVD to videos to streaming. Streaming, yeah. And on even demand. if you want from theaters to streaming, yeah. Bit, you know, there's this. But now there's no more shelf space needed there's no everyone can watch it anywhere at any time right and i worked on many pictures in my career where i saw that distribution was a big hurdle so i started this uh i mean i worked on yeah, french films which exactly didn't get released here i don't know why they're beautiful and they would have some audience right not the mass audience of uh, pirates of the caribbean but mm -hmm. There's some, and now that the cost is very low to distribute, or it should be, yeah, because it's streaming. Why not? And I, for example, I cannot watch any show, any of my my kids, any of the content uh, movies or shows I had seen when I grew up in Germany. Mm -hmm. So the same thing. And if you have 10 million Chinese living in America, they can't really, you know, there's no streaming service for them. Right. So I. Um, I started this tech startup because I'm always yeah, have this that's tech mind, right, how you which started too, provides yeah. distribution, film distribution, or whatever the content is, directly to streaming services for everyone, everyone who has professional content. Wow. And there are many, many filmmakers who, um, and it's, you know, many, many filmmakers who have done a film, a documentary, and there's beautiful things out there. And you just upload it to this to the platform, wow. and this website uh, markets it and delivers it and does every all the technology to the streaming service in the world. So you have now, for the first time, you have now guaranteed global distribution for your film. So you can just create, and then the rest is guaranteed. That's I mean I, I just love your way of thinking too because I mean you also you did similar not similar but another and. and kind of what you did with label zero and, and right. pro providing your music to license it to anybody right. and you, exactly. you can use it in your film you can use it you just you can pay for it or you can take it for free but i mean it's it's just getting wider distribution and, and a wider audience i think it's empowering both the audience and the creators yeah. more than it used to be we had the middlemen including of course the, the studios who feed me here right, right. i mean yeah. i i'm not saying i'm going against it but we have to all we have to go along what the, what the audience wants and right. what's being created. 99% of, of all let just feature films created do not get distribution. Yeah. This year Sundance there were 14,000 movies and TV and I think less than 100 got distribution. Yeah. So I don't think the other 13,900 are bad necessarily. Right. They, they just don't fit in someone else's pocket in this moment or portfolio. Exactly. Well, and I have this many times but this is not good you know, I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think only the audience should decide. Right. It's a bit Put it out there and let the audience watch it or not watch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Right. And since um, if we create technology which makes it very, very, very cheap to distribute it, mm -hmm. you cannot afford to do everything else, even if it doesn't make that much money, maybe right. on a per title basis. Yeah. And you'd be surprised that there's some successful stuff out there now mm -hmm. uh, which you never had no distribution before. And oh. you know, a filmmaker can now make a living and can make the next one. Maybe create an, a bigger title, get mm -hmm. get better financing because he can show. Look, oh yeah, I've, I've seen it. Right. And there's also um, lots of um, movies and other. There's other titles like educational titles. Uh, there's uh, sports. There's also um, these what they call the digital creators, the digital uh, original creators, mm -hmm. um, who you know, this is a new type of filmmakers which I really support. Um, they you know, we used to call them YouTubers. We look yeah. down on them a bit from Hollywood perspective. Right. But these have billions of views and, and millions of fans. I know. And they create what we used to do, TV shows. Yeah? Yes. And, and those need to get not only out from on YouTube, they need to go out everywhere in the world. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So that's what we do. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's one of uh, you know, what I do right <laughs> now a lot. And then I always really write music, but yeah. uh, also did a lot of movies. And I think um, at this point in my career, 
it's time to like uh, uh, take yeah. a, a breather and um, and um, do. I still do movies. But yeah, I of do course. Much so. less. I don't do ten a year and overlap yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and stress it out. Um, but talking, you, know, you just talk about distribution and, and, and the issues you're trying to solve there. But looking at Hollywood as a whole, or not Hollywood, film industry as a whole. I mean, are there uh, who've, who've been through it and you lived through it? Uh, what today in 2017? Are, what are the good things that are happening in this industry? And what are the bad things? Like, what are what's some good things? What's some bad things that you've seen? Good question. Um, I, let me start with the good things. I have to even think about the bad things, but because I see everything as an opportunity. That's generally my idea, mm -hmm. my, my my philosophy. Um, yeah, of course, the bad things you want is like, okay, the old world of how movies been made um, doesn't really work anymore like this. It gets more and more risky. Mm. The bad thing happened then is that, okay, I knew I do start, now I do start <laughs> with bad things, is that we do, uh, you know, the franchise recycling. Yeah. To me as a creator, obviously, it's very boring. Mm -hmm. May I say that? Uh, you know, to do another Batman beats Alien versus Predator mm -hmm. versus... I, I, it's not that interesting. I mean, yeah, for some reason, there is an audience, obviously. They wouldn't buy the tickets otherwise. Right. But we have built this city with creating and telling beautiful stories. Right. I'm talking like E.T. and you know, mainstream stuff. Yeah. But like, you know, you were like crying and laughing and, and going along as so many of these. Movies. Right. And that, I think, is now our weakness. We don't do this that much. It's true. Yeah. And now the good part is that Today you can create with um, you're not dependent on high budgets necessarily. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, you still need quite a, uh, a setup to mm -hmm. do a feature film, but it's not necessarily that you're completely dependent on the on the studios like you were in the seventies, eighties, right. where this only worked with an uh, eighty-five people on the set. Uh, digital production workflows, etc. Everything you know, you can do now. Create with a good idea, you can create something really seriously. Uh, competitive right um, and that's the opportunity now uh, that filmmakers now have is I have a good idea I think um, I can I have now much more control to get financing mm -hmm. I have much more control to do production and much more control to get to an audience you don't need the billboards on on Santa Monica Boulevard yeah. and the full page ads in these magazines right you can now, you know, find your audience. They're online. They're, they're the tastemakers. This, yeah. you know, you can connect. You can, if you're active, you can do. Uh, you can move so much today, and that's you know what what the startup hopefully helps too. What I'm doing with exactly. innovation. Yeah. But also, it's now in the back in the hands of of the creators and the audience much more. Same with music. I mean, it happened in music a few years ago. Yeah. You can sure. now record the pristine top quality your uh, no, albums and and songs and get them straight into iTunes and Spotify and whatnot Exactly. if you build them with your audience. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, smaller composers do that now where they're, they're, an album which wouldn't get picked up by a label can go yeah. distribute them themselves and go straight to Spotify and find an audience. And today I would say if you have a record deal, that's your kiss of death. Mm. I think it's actually a bad thing. Well, yeah. You should hold on to it as long as you can until, you know, there's a certain, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a niche now for the mainstream. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a need for you know a record label, a big yeah. mainstream label, um, but I wouldn't. Tr sorry, I wouldn't uh, necessarily blindly trust them. Your to build up an artist, they mm. haven't done this for twenty years to build artists. Right, you have to do it yourself anyway. Why have them participate from day one, and you lose control and you pay for it? True. And the same yeah. for filmmakers. Now you don't need to sign that deal. You mm -hmm. can um, see what you, you know get financing on alternative now it's alternative routes very soon there will be the mainstream routes yeah I mean it's it's such an interesting time too especially you know I'm, I'm young in this industry too and then yeah. diving into it and and um, and it's just uh, I mean talking with you is definitely I, I love getting your perspective and everything so I appreciate it I mean it. you're in the studio world still right yeah I, I work in uh, Cartoon Network and, and studio yeah, well, yeah but you see the still probably right it's, and there must be much more of <clears throat> like okay we have to you see that there are different avenues now. Absolutely, yeah. There's so much more, and I, I, I'm very proud of where I work at too because the studio yeah. is um, creator based. So they will yeah. find an idea and they they let them have the control. Like Fantastic. we're not trying to build a brand. I mean, of course we are trying to build it to monetize it, but yeah, to to see the creators have full control of their shows and it's just amazing. It's amazing, yeah. yeah. And that's and that's how we create with integrity. That's what I learned a lot in the uh, international pictures I did. 
that uh, it's easier to create something with integrity if you have yeah, some control. Exactly. And sometimes I work with pictures here where it's hard to do to keep the integrity because there's so many people who like uh, shave off the corners and right. edges and yeah. at the end we're like, you're... Hmm. Yeah, you kind of recognize what it was. It has yeah. a similar shape but not exactly what you thought of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes actually we had, I had pictures where marketing departments showed me what movie we actually wanted to do at the beginning. Wow. <laughs> I mean, they, um, they didn't, yeah. that wasn't their intention. Yeah. But I saw what they did and we're like, it could be so easy. Amazing what you guys are doing. Guys, come back. Let's have a look. And isn't this, this could be so easy to make this movie. Let's, right. let's switch around. You know, it's, it is sometimes so easy, but you lose track often because there's so much, it's a big responsibility, yes, yeah. high cost, uh, big risk. Absolutely. Uh, jobs at stake. It's, it's difficult sometimes. So um, that's why I, I, I love also independent film and, and other, other things. Uh, yeah. They did some ballets in China now. Mm. Production. I know. No way. Well, you know. Like I said, yeah. it's not what your agent would com re would recommend as your next career <laughs> yeah. step. And I go often against what they recommend. Yeah. I don't actually listen um, because it's about me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, how I connect with. I think I can only be proud of something, and that translates in inspiration. Absolutely. And if you don't, you hear that if it's if you don't. Right. So. You know, as you work and you're, you, you, we talked about earlier about how you're trapped in a room all the time. You're, you're kind of locked away and, and mixing. So, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies that you like to do to refresh? To refresh the creativity, to refresh the brain, or the spirit, or whatever. Mm. Or do, do you like to travel? Do you have hobby, like sports? Is anything that you? I actually like. Funny enough, uh, I like coding. Oh wow! Um, yeah. As as a you know, if you want to have free time, mm -hmm. um, that is extremely creative. I think. Uh, we totally underrate these developers. But yeah. they, how you write code is very similar to do architecture and very similar to write music. Very, yeah. Um, and of course, I have now four children, so that's not even a hobby. That's like a, <laughs> that's yeah, just, it's uh, a necessity. Job, yeah. But it's beautiful how they. Uh, uh, yeah, there's so much they give me there. Mm -hmm. um, and I love. I do love traveling. I, I did too much traveling um, because of like Paris back and forth. I have right. a studio in Paris. I have a studio in Beijing. I have a studio in LA and a, and a mobile studio. I did too much traveling, yeah. so I wanted to actually that's uh, to, to plant some roots a little bit. Yeah, I love now sitting to relax with my laptop in in a coffee shop. Yeah, or uh, this is a place. Uh, it's a it's a shared workspace where you uh, have lots of startups and people who are some of them are entertainment, some of uh, them are not. Right, and you learn so much. And the energy of other writing music in a dark room is like a one person show and right. when you get out it's either dark or you know yeah but you don't know yeah you don't. <laughs> uh, and it's so great to be able to if i do less now i will do one movie at a time and then I have a break and i can really really um have something to create from again yeah know? well klaus i want to thank you so much for your time today it's thank been you. so i mean so informative and, and, and oh, it's great chatting with forever, you. sorry it's no a, it's uh, i mean and they, i mean I love your work and everything that you do and, and you stand for and you and so really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs>